Welcome, my friends, to CHSF 2106, Chapter 7. So today we're going to be looking at the nature of adolescence, so the physical and cognitive aspects of development during this time period and how we're seeing changes in the brain and also changes in the endocratic and hormonal system and how this is going to kind of lead to a lot of the behavioral and social and personality development that we're going to look at more as we start into the next course in the new year, getting into Chapter 8. Anyways, glad you're here and... Uh, you know, grab a coffee and a, and a comfy chair and let's get into some psych. All right, The Nature of Adolescence, Chapter 7. Being a teen can be an amazing time of discovery, learning, and friendship, but it's also a time of rapid change and emotional highs and lows where things can feel really tough. So what's going on in our brains and bodies that make us feel this way? Why is being a teen so hard? We're often told that the most important years of brain development are between 0 and 5 years old, although recent research has found adolescent development to be equally important. During childhood, our brains continually grow, generating gray matter until they reach their maximum size, which for girls is around age 12 and boys around age 14. But even after this, the brain works to become more efficient by cutting away unused gray matter that isn't exercised by experience, and at the same time increasing myelin, which is fatty tissue that insulates brain pathways. Puberty begins in the hypothalamus, where a protein called kispeptin is produced, triggering the pituitary gland to unleash the hormones testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. These activate the ovaries and testes, but also cause you to seek emotionally charged experiences, whether it's a movie to make you sob or driving 180 kilometers per hour down the freeway. It causes your response to emotionally loaded images or sounds to be more intense, which is why listening to One Direction may produce large bouts of the feels. The area of the brain responsible for planning ahead and assessing risk is still immature in teenagers, which is why teens are more likely to participate in high-risk behavior like unprotected sex and drinking and driving. Interestingly, in a simulated driving experience, adults and teens took the same amount of driving risks while alone, however, when surrounded by an audience of friends, teens took significantly more risks while adults were unaffected. What's the benefit of this behavior? peer acceptance. In a study where teens were asked to rank music clips with and without knowing what their peers had picked, their choices changed. Unlike small children and adults, feeling socially isolated as a teen creates feelings of intense unworthiness. This, along with our biology, can contribute to teens prioritizing friends over even family. As social animals, stepping outside the safety of our family creates genetically diverse populations, diminishing the likeliness of inbreeding. In fact, teens have heightened social abilities like processing and evaluating facial expressions better than other age groups, allowing teens to be extremely cognizant of friends' joy, sadness, or stress. Speaking of stress, the hormone released in stressful situations to help soothe the brain cells of children and adults has the opposite impact on teens, causing an increase in anxiety. Pair that with a change in circadian rhythms, making you want to wake up three to four hours later than adults, it's no wonder some people describe teens as emotionally moody. On the other hand, teens are very physically healthy. The immune system is highly functioning, teens have increased tolerance to temperature changes, and a high resistance to cancer. But despite physical fitness, records show that death rates increase by 200 to 300 percent after childhood due to motor vehicle accidents, homicide, and suicide. Scientists believe that many changes in white matter, gray matter, and connections in the brain may be to blame with an increased risk of errors during this time. But with a greater number of synaptic connections and increased plasticity, the teenage brain is primed to learn quickly and memorize content fast. Unlike an older brain rooted in what it knows, teens can respond easily to their environment and make incredible strides in communication and socialization. Not to mention being passionate is incredibly valuable and taking risks is often what is needed to make change in your life and the lives of others. Being a teen can be tough, but it can also be amazing. If you want to know why teens are the biggest super fans and become obsessed with their favorite bands and shows, check out our latest ASAP Thought on the science of fandom. Links are in the description to see that video. And subscribe for more weekly science videos. So when we're looking at puberty, and this is one of these like things that I obviously know that you know what puberty is and you've taken high school health and you've probably taken more advanced health studies looking at these kind of things and at a certain point we are talking about though this 
fact that besides the zero to two time period, puberty is where we see this. Probably the second biggest compared to that, I would have to say, this developmental jump, right? And this developmental jump we call puberty or this massive transformation at a hormonal and uh, very physical, physiological level. And then also at the level of how that affects brain development. So, you know, there's a long history of worrying about how adolescents will turn out. And as early as 1904 in the field of psychology, there was a guy named Stanley Hall, who you might remember me mentioning. He's the guy that kind of coined the term norms and got everyone talking about norms, like um, these norms and developmental milestones, like a kid should do this by this age and this by this age. In 1904, Stanley Hall was proposing that adolescence could be viewed as this storm and stress so we called it as like the storm and stress period of life and think about it you know storm and stress meaning like now you're in this social world where all of a sudden you all of a sudden kind of biologically you're set up to all of a sudden care way more about what everybody thinks you know be very comparison based in your understanding of self and others and not to mention having like the whole advertising marketing engine aimed at you. Which is sort of part of the 403 uh, special topics course I teach in the spring. If any of you are interested, I take a more critical look at some of those players in the game that are, you know, deliberately taking advantage of the fact from a marketing perspective of the manipulable mind of the teenager who's kind of in this in between stage right adolescence like not not an adult but you're this preparatory period so we're going to be looking at this we're going to be looking at this idea of like the brain uh neuroendocrine process right so this relationship between neurons or like the kind of messaging in the brain and then the endocrine system or like this uh well, I'm going to show a few videos that in this presentation, it's going to be a little bit like that biological beginnings one where I sort of give you the definition and then I'm going to show you animations because I think it's the easiest way to show it. Something like the endocrine system and how that's related to like the release of basically messages in the brain that tell other parts of the brain, like specifically the pituitary gland to send messages to, for example, your, your gonads or your sexual organs to initiate a lot of the changes of puberty. Right, and that this is happening at a biochemical messaging level. It's, it's pretty uh, interesting from that perspective, and that's kind of one of the ways we're going to look at it. And then we're also going to look at how this is playing out with changes at the cognitive brain level. The endocrine system is composed of 10 glands in different parts of the body. When the endocrine glands are stimulated, they produce molecules called hormones and release them into the vascular system. Hormones are like chemical messengers, transported by the blood to target cells. When it reaches a target cell, the hormone attaches itself to a specific receptor, which triggers a physiological process such as cell division. The production of many hormones is controlled by two small structures located at the base of the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is composed of nerve nuclei that control vital functions such as sleep. The hypothalamus also controls the pituitary gland, which is the main hormone producing gland. The pituitary gland alone secretes nine different hormones. Vasopressin, for example, regulates kidney functioning. Oxytocin causes contractions of the uterus during childbirth. Other pituitary hormones control skin pigmentation and bone growth. Together, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland produce a third of the body's hormones. They therefore have an effect on many physiological processes.
What are hormones? A hormone is a chemical messenger that is secreted or released into our bloodstream by specific organs known as glands. Hormones regulate or control many processes in our body, including blood glucose levels, water content in blood, general growth and blood pressure, just to name a few. As an example, thyroxine, which is a hormone secreted by your thyroid gland, helps to regulate metabolism. In other lessons, you will learn about a few of these hormones in more detail. Several hormones are secreted by the pituitary gland, located right below the hypothalamus in your brain. Instructions are given by the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland according to current conditions in our body. The secreted hormones travel through the bloodstream to target organs where either a specific response is directly produced or it stimulates or causes the target organ to secrete its own hormones. We can think of this like a post office system. Hormones or posts must reach the correct target organs or addresses for the right response to occur. Feeling thirsty? When the hypothalamus detects low levels of water in blood, it signals or tells the pituitary gland to release a hormone called the antidiuretic hormone or ADH into your bloodstream. ADH travels to your kidneys, in this case the target organ, and causes water to be absorbed so urine becomes more concentrated and output is decreased. Drinking more water increases the water content in your blood, which then causes the hypothalamus to signal the pituitary gland to secrete less ADH. Less ADH means your kidneys will absorb less water, causing urine to become less concentrated and output is increased. Ever felt suddenly frightened? When threatened, the brain activates neurons that stimulate the adrenal gland located right above your kidneys to rapidly secrete adrenaline. Adrenaline then acts on your heart and lungs to increase heart rate and breathing rate. This, along with other physiological responses, is known as the fight or flight response and is activated very quickly. At the same time, the hypothalamus signals the pituitary gland to secrete the adrenocorticotropic hormone, which travels to the adrenal glands to secrete a hormone known as cortisol. Cortisol acts in target organs to allow the body to adapt long-term to stress. So to review, hormones are chemical messengers secreted by glands into the bloodstream and produce a specific response when they reach the target organ. So if we look at this chart here, it shows this idea that early adolescence girls tend to outweigh boys, but by about 14 or so, uh, boys begin to surpass girls. And you can see this kind of growth spurt represented in the graph to the right, where it's looking at height gain in centimeters per year. And you see that for females, it really, and notice how this isn't saying like overall height, it's talking about the amount of gain. So the amount of growth spurt, and you're seeing that with Females, the real growth spurt is a little shy on average of 12 years. So like, uh, I don't know, you'd probably have to put that at like, say, 11.8 or something like that. And then for males, it's closer to 16, right? So right before 16. So like, you know, deep into their 16th year, almost before their 16th birthday is when you see a, this huge jump in, in males in terms of size, especially height. And so a lot of this is being caused by this stuff behind the scenes. And on the next video, I'm going to show you an example of on the screen here, you see this term HPG. And the next video is going to look sort of at that. It's going to look at a thing called HPA, which is the exact same thing, just how the process affects the adrenal system instead of the, the gonads or the sex organs. But it's this idea that if you just kind of break down the words that the hypothalamus, this part of your brain, sends a message to the pituitary gland, this other part of your brain, that then sends a message to the gonads, the sex organs, right? The testes or the ovaries, depending on if we're talking about uh, males or females. Now, the video, I couldn't just find an awesome video that showed that, but I found a video that showed HPA, which is the same kind of idea that the hypothalamus is sending a message to the pituitary gland, but in that sense, the pituitary, or in that instance, the pituitary gland is sending a message then to the adrenal gland to let out adrenaline. So like, for example, that's the stress response. So it's the same type of messaging, right? The hypothalamus that's controlling these biorhythms, sending the message to the pituitary gland, which is like kind of this really small but really important messaging system that then is sending this messenger chemical to the gonads or the adrenal glands or wherever, to any of the organs, which is actually a pretty wild idea when you think about it. Like what does sending a message from your brain to an organ really mean? Well, it means that there's some kind of coding 
contained in the biochemical, right? The actual literal liquid that's in the blood. Tremendous physical changes occur during adolescence that reflect activation of the HPG axis, the hypothalamus pituitary gland gonad connection, right? So it's a pathway. The hypothalamus is the structure of the brain that monitors eating and sex and increased release of hypothalamic hormones stimulates the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is an important endocrine gland that controls growth and regulates other glands by releasing its own hormones. The gonads, with the testes in males and the ovaries in females, release testosterone and estrogen, hormones that are particularly important for giving rise to pubertal or pubertal, like puberty-based, changes in the body. The concentration of certain hormones can increase dramatically during adolescence. Uh, testosterone and estradiol, a type of estrogen, are present in the hormonal makeup of both boys and girls. However, whereas testosterone is associated with the development of the genitals, an increase in height, and a change in voice in boys, estradiol is associated with breast, uh, the uterine, and the skeletal development of girls. The extent to which this influx of hormones also contributes to psychological development in adolescence is under debate. Um, which is to say the least, right? So it's like, what does going through puberty, how does that affect your thinking? Like obviously it does, right? It's like making you totally see yourself different and other people different. Like to think that that had no effect on your psychology seems, uh, I don't know, a very simple way of looking at things. Of course it affects it. The extent to which it affects though is under debate and any relationship between hormones and behaviors is almost certainly complex and bi-directional right so hormones are influencing behavior behaviors influencing hormones it's it's not it's an arrow with points on both sides okay so this next video just you want to have in your notes because you're going to be like hpg and then the next video says hpa and it seems different but it's just talking about a different type of so the pituitary gland communicates to the organs right so it can send a message to your liver or it can send a message to your your gonads. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the HPA axis. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, or HPA, axis is best known for its role in our body's reaction to stress. The HPA axis includes a group of hormone-secreting glands from the nervous and endocrine systems, the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal glands. The hypothalamus is a small neuroendocrine structure situated just above the brainstem that controls the release of hormones from the pituitary gland, a hormone-secreting gland that sits just below the hypothalamus. The pituitary gland can release hormones into the bloodstream to reach a variety of targets. In the case of the HPA axis, hormones released from the pituitary gland travel down to the kidneys and influence the secretion of hormones from endocrine glands called the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. The primary function of the HPA axis is to regulate the stress response. When we experience something stressful, the hypothalamus releases a hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. CRH signals the pituitary gland to secrete a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, into the bloodstream. ACTH travels down to the adrenal glands where it prompts the release of a hormone called cortisol from the cortex or outer layer of the adrenal glands. The release of cortisol causes a number of changes that help the body to deal with stress. For example, it helps to mobilize energy like glucose so the body has enough energy to cope with a prolonged stressor. When cortisol levels in the blood get high, this is sensed by receptors in areas of the brain like the hypothalamus and hippocampus, which leads to the shutting off of the stress response through what is known as a negative feedback mechanism. So another an important term here, monarchy, refers to uh, when, the, when a girl or when a female has their first menstruation, usually comes relatively late in the pubertal cycle. Around the world, the average age of monarchy has declined significantly since the mid-19th century. 
Uh, the researchers think that's likely ch due to changes mainly in, in nutrition. Uh, we do know that it's associated with certain environmental factors too, though, like, well, low birth weight, that'd be more of a uh, nature side of an effect, but things like obesity seem to be related to it. Things like growing up in a single parent family or in families where there's no uh, dad specifically seem to be associated with it. So however that stress is impacting, it'd be, there'd be an interesting kind of socio biological reason behind that where kind of the, that's nature nurture, a really interesting nature nurture example actually that adolescents become preoccupied with their body, right? Because their body's changing. And it's like, not only is their body changing, their body's changing at a time when they're very aware of everybody else who's also changing and what everybody else thinks of them, right? So when you're super aware and super care about what everyone thinks of you, that's a tough time to have your body changing in unpredictable, weird ways. And what we know is that kids, especially females, especially young teenage girls that have some of the lowest levels of self-esteem and it's actually really a big problem. It's a big area that needs to be addressed because as you can tell from some of my other comments and side comments, it's like there's so much of the advertising marketing world aimed at young teenagers and particularly girls. Um, and we know it affects how they think in terms of things like body image and these are all really kind of big important issues. And the, the, the tie-in, though, to this course specifically is that this is all happening at a time where for these girls and boys, to a, an, another extent, but in, in different ways, they're at such a developmentally sensitive time. That's why it matters in a course like this. Because in a course like this, we're making the argument that as a society, we should care about the messaging, not from the perspective, well, I don't know, I know everyone has their opinion, but having things developmentally appropriate, I think, makes sense. Right. So what I mean by that is not necessarily that I'm talking about like we should be careful about allowing targeted messaging to our children. I think that's a fair point. In terms of maturation patterns, there's also some interesting research looking at how maturing early affects males and females differently. And that for boys, it actually seems to be associated with a lot of social success. So if you think back to high school or whatever of like the guy that's like big for his age, tended to be maybe better at sports, maybe was like, I don't know, it just seems to be most people that are, are mature early as boys when you ask them about their experience tend to report. And again, a lot of this is based on self-report, a more positive experience tend to perceive themselves more positively, more successful in relation to their peers. For females... Or sorry, I'll just continue that point. Late maturing boys in their 30s have developed a stronger sense of identity, right? So it's almost a developmental positive, whereas a lot of girls that develop earlier deal with, um, I don't know, I think it'd be fair to say pressures that are not developmentally appropriate and, you know, is associated with all, all the types of things on the screen there that you worry about as a parent. And... I think you you could maybe write really interesting page, papers on this. And if anyone, I know it's a bit late this term, but next term, if you're in my classes, I'm going to give you opportunities to do assignments. And if you wanted to sort of tie back to something around this, I think it would be interesting. I think um, there's not a lot of, I haven't seen a lot of really rigorous empirical data on this, but I think I think there's, a, there's something here. So it's an interesting point to consider. Okay, so I want to spend some time looking at this diagram and kind of getting into these areas of the brain that are kind of associated with the cognitive development aspect of adolescence. And we're going to be looking at the corpus callosum or these nerve, nerve fibers that uh, connect. I'm laughing because this is like my third time doing this slide and I keep messing up the word nerve. I'm putting the B in it. I'm saying it like the V is a B. These nerve fibers that connect the two sides of the brain they thicken in adolescence now it's pretty interesting that um and i'll make this i think to maybe make this point already but about how this is connect has some connection to attention deficit but as this thickens in adolescence 
the, the team begins to process information more effectively. We're going to be talking about the prefrontal cortex, the, which we've talked about a lot, or this kind of the most advanced part of your brain, the amygdala, the emotional center, and then the limbic system, or the kind of the reward center of the brain. I'm just going to read a piece, okay? So you don't necessarily need to have any of this written down. You could have what's on the screen. Those are kind of nice uh, short forms. I'm going to do a bit more here. Recall that nearly twice as much synaptic connections are made as will ever be used. The connections that we do use are strengthened and survived, while the unused ones are replaced by other pathways and disappear. In the language of neuroscience, these unused connections are pruned like a bonsai tree. As a result of this pruning, by the end of adolescence, individuals have fewer, more selective, more effective neuronal connections than they did as children. This pruning indicates that the activities in which adolescents choose to engage and to not engage in influence which neural connections are strengthened and which ones disappear. Under fMRI, so functional magnetic reasoning imagery, scans, so the difference in that and just an MRI is, this is oversimplistic, but if, if you want is picture, one is video. Functional MRI, you can actually see how things, it's not just a snapshot. You can see how like a chemical is moving through the brain. Blood flow. The corpus callosum, where nerve fibers connect the brain's left and right hemispheres, thickens in adolescence, improving an adolescent's ability to process information. The prefrontal cortex doesn't finish maturing until approximately 18 to 25. Okay, so, and, and you've heard me say that before, and we'll talk about the prefrontal cortex a lot in this course, because, you know, it's a, my lame psychology joke, but teaching psychology is my prefrontal, prefrontal cortex communicating with yours. It's the part of you that you think is you. At a lower level, subcortical, below the, um, you know, wrinkly cap, sometimes call it. So subcortical is the region of the brain located underneath the cerebral cortex, right? We call the cerebral cortex the outer layer of neural tissue um, that's common in humans and animals. Then below that there's this what we call the in the subcortical, so below the cortical part, we have the limbic system. Again, I'm not going to be grilling you too hard on this stuff, but I know this is getting deep into biology, but I want you to have this kind of picture because it's so neat. Then we have this limbic system or this seat of emotion, meaning this is like where the signaling for emotions comes from again in the brain, right? That So this brings into question this age old difference between what's the difference between thoughts and feelings. It's completely uh, developed by early adolescence. It's almost completely developed. By the end of adolescence, I mean, so we said before, by about 25. Oh, sorry, sorry, I kind of got messed up there. The prefrontal cortex developed by about 25. The limbic system is developed earlier in adolescence. Okay, so there's some debate, but like in the earlier teen years. So this is kind of interesting. Okay, so sorry for it being a bit confusing there, but I'm like four minutes in. And I, I think if you can correct your note that one point, then we save the beginning of this rant but like basically what it's saying is that you reach full maturity not even maturity because it's not maturity but it's the ability to feel the emotion before you reach the full development of the prefrontal cortex and that sort of makes sense right and that's sort of what t being teenage at least what i remember as an old 40 year old was like it's like things felt very intense and one of the nice things about getting older is like life's sort of the same, but it sort of calms a little bit in some ways. And it's like, it doesn't feel as all or nothing. And my point is some of that all or nothing is actually biochemical and age appropriate. And it makes sense if you felt like that. And it makes sense if you felt like that and also felt confused by that, because that's sort of what this is saying is that the limbic system is at a higher, it's closer to its end point than the, than the prefrontal cortex, the part of you that's you. So the part of you that's making sense of all this isn't the, as the, isn't at its final point yet, but you're having these very adult emotions. That's maybe the way to say it. The limbic system 
is this i said this a couple times but the seat of emotions and this is where our reward system lives this is also where addictions live it doesn't say that in my notes but that's just a side point um but this part is where uh matures earlier i've said that like 10 times so that's maybe a question okay i want you to know that idea that the limb the limbic system is maturing earlier than the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system is involved in the emotions it's because it's like the amygdala is part of it it's part of the limbic system in addition to structural changes the levels of different neurotransmitters change with the onset with the onset of puberty so basically it's like not just these things but at the same time the chemicals flowing through the brain are changing the neurotransmitters right the biochemical mess and sometimes actually if we're talking about your brain electrical transmitters which means signals being sent neuronically through the brain it's wild it's like you what you actually are and what your experience is is this system of incredibly intricate and complex biological Biochemical, I keep meaning, when I keep saying that, I'm basically talking about messaging going through the blood and the lymphatic system, well, the blood, and then in chem and electrically. It's like, it's so interesting. For example, an increase in the neurotransmitter dopamine occurs in both the prefrontal cortex and in the limbic system during adolescence. And researchers know that dopamine plays a huge role in reward seeking behavior. All right, a seven minute slide. Ooh, I'm getting longer. But with this presentation, it might be a bit shorter than some, and I'm gonna do some of these rants where I kind of show some pictures and stuff. But again, it's like, I'm trying to, I wanna, I know you're taking different kinds of psych from different teachers and everyone has their different style. And I think I wanna kind of focus my teaching on what, develop, what makes developmental psychology developmentally focused and what that really means. And what that really means is like, were these complex organisms that seem like, to use Piaget's words, we have a genetic epistemology, we have this like built-in system of development and at the same time, it's engaging in this highly complex social reality. And that's a snapshot. The long story is there was a lot of people before us and that their whole story is deeply encoded in who we are literally okay so at the same time there's this emerging aspect of identity that is related to sexuality right so this is when the teenagers are in high school they're maybe having serious relationships for the first time and it's well to say it's complicated is that maybe the right word it's like it's it's high school trying to figure out who you are and trying to figure out the feelings that you're having and trying to figure out a, a way to move forward and it's like regulating or controlling some of these feelings that are emerging and how it relates to identity and who you are is this multifaceted and lengthy process meaning it's like complicated and has all these factors related to it facets related to it and it's something that happens over years and it's not just this is the thing that's so complex about it is it's happening to you and to all of your peers in this like super social concentration of your life called high school where you're never going to probably in your life have another scenario where you're around that many people in that such a small developmental cohort of like basically whatever a thousand people that are within three years of each other it's like it's like a developmental cauldron and that's sort of what you know in its most ideal form that's what school should be but my point there was i got off point my point there was that the complexity of that so it's like all these complex social things and trying to fit in and trying to figure out who you are and maybe try to figure out dating or not being comfortable with that or or being comfortable with that and parties and all the you know it's a complex time and that whole time people are trying to maybe you people are feeling sexually prepared for things that they don't feel emotionally prepared for and we know that different kinds of nurture or kind of situational environmental factors play a role like some of the same ones we said before like um being in high stress environments being in, in in environments where 
there's not parental figures present as much. Studies have found that adolescent males who play sports show higher levels of risk-taking sexually. Very interestingly, females that play competitive sports tend to show lower levels of risk-taking. So that's a very interesting... Um, you could examine that, obviously, from like a sociological perspective or just from any kind of perspective. It's like if people want reference to that, that's straight out of the textbook. And that's an interesting finding. That's a finding you could shape a thesis around or not a thesis, at least a research project. Because it's an interesting point, right? That's an interesting, just to think of this, this is a side note, but for future presentations or papers that you do, sometimes an interesting thing I've seen students do is like present an idea like that that almost begs for analysis, right? You like, give me this scenario and you say like, exposure in sports has this effect on males and this effect on females. And it's like literally the opposite effect. That's an interesting thing if you follow up that point by saying why. So, when women have babies, in their while, while still being teens or adolescents, there's increased risk for both mom and baby. The biggest risks to baby, especially if mom is at least a, decently into her teens and 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 things get r riskier the the lower the age, but um, and I'm trying to talk delicately about this because infant mortality is a very delicate thing, but to, to lose a baby is uh, more likely if the mom's younger. And, and of course, like once you get to a certain age, that's, that's not the case anymore near the end of adolescence. But adolescent mothers are more likely to be depressed, more likely to drop out of school, less likely to go back to school and finish later than women that leave for career-related reasons or work-related reasons. Um, now, again, having said that, these are on average, right? There's lots of moms. In, in my work at Conestoga College, I've taught dozens and dozens of single moms that went back to college and that made whole careers of them, for themselves. And, like, I've, I've seen those turnaround stories, so they exist. There's moms out there all over the place and dads that are holding a lot of weight and carrying it well. And it's like, and it's highly respectable. It's also very difficult. And, and, and some of the reasons why it's more difficult for a teen are almost completely obvious, right? Like it's difficult raising, it's difficult. Like, let me just be honest for a sec. It's difficult for me and my wife having two kids sometimes. And, and we both have jobs and I'm 40 and she's like 35, right? So to be a, a, a single teen, that's what I'm saying. It's like there's a tremendous, I have tremendous res respect for people that have the commitment to their child and all that stuff. And I don't mean to sound like I'm talking down, but there are developmental concerns. And the, the big concern for the kid is birth weight. Okay, so... I got a bit rambly there, but the key concern for the child is birth weight. I want to say this because this is going to come up, I think, later, but in case I haven't said this yet or I miss it later, depression and motherhood, and there's a really important point that, you, that I need to tell you and that is important for you to know, but also for you to kind of share with people in, I don't mean share and like the way we use that as our society, but like... I mean, when you're talking to your friends or whatever, if they're feeling down and they have a newborn, what they need to know, the most important thing is, what's bad for the newborn isn't if mom's depressed. What's bad for the newborn is is if is when mom is depressed and the depression causes mom to pull back and interact less frequently. The less frequent interactions with the baby is bad for baby. So moms that are depressed need to be told that they need to interact with the baby more than they feel like they should. It's actually a behavioral intervention. It's the frequency of interaction that is, is hard on the baby. So, sorry, I got emotional talking about that, but I think that's like such a key thing that not enough people know. It's like, it's if you're struggling, and we know that when you're struggling with depression, you're gonna view 
the amount you're interacting with your baby as enough when it's not enough. And if you know that one point and you act from a place of knowing that one point, you can significantly reduce how much it affects the kid. It's a very important point. Okay, so there's also, I want to touch on a few of kind of physical and health related concerns that are going on at the same time and things that are with this current situation with the pandemic and everything just becoming crisis level on all accounts um especially in terms of things like obesity things like reductions in, in exercise i probably don't have to tell you any of this the effect that that has on things like blood pressure and even increasing um incidence of type 2 ad adolescence um right because that i kind of read that point backwards it's saying positive outcomes of exercises is less type 2 so reduced exercises associated with increased type 2 diabetes it's interesting and this is a really important point for a lot of you that are in um that are interested i know that you're taking this like childhood health and family studies and you're really interested in this idea of the early child's developmental context and understanding that like the way that that situation is shaped has a huge effect on how much exercise the child does how much and that's true for adults too right it's like it's very hard to cut and paste in exercise it almost has to become part of what you do and that's why i recommend to everyone like going on walks and stuff like that and it's like trying to get outside a bit every day it's those kind of things have this huge cumulative long-term effect um things like sleep Adolescents actually need a lot of sleep and should be encouraged to sleep in when they can. Um, despite the fact that a lot of people kind of consider teenagers lazy, it's actually the demand they need for, for restful sleep is actually as high as only the only people that have more demand are basically newborns. And some of it's because of all this development that's happening and that sleep is actually this synthesizing, integrating process. There's a lot of processing going on. that as the teen gets older their their body clock their biological rhythms shift and that can delay their period of wakefulness by as much as an hour if you're interested in that there's an awesome uh, bbc documentary you can find on youtube that i sometimes used to show my class called the uh, the secret history or the secret life i think the secret life of the body clock and they talk about these kind of internal biorhythms that are so core to being human So I need to touch on this too, and I'm I'm going to do it gently. Um, I know a lot of people struggle with with things related to eating disorders and and substance use, obviously too. Anorexia is an eating disorder that involves the this relentless pursuit of thinness through starvation, whereas bulimia and nervosa. And notice how both those words have this nervosa or this uh, anxiety component. That eating disorders where individuals are constantly follow up with this binge purge pattern of, of overeating and then purging um and the thing is is like my point is if any people that hear this are struggling with that that a lot of behavioral psychology um approaches have found a lot of success helping people it is something that people can get help with but a lot of times it takes a pretty drastic behavioral intervention because eating is so uh, pattern based that the pattern has to be addressed and monitored but my point is that help is is available um an interesting side point on this is something i looked into a lot of, a while ago but is steroid use amongst teenage boys um which in my day was a huge thing and I think you could make an argument that you could also view that as an eating disorder it's definitely a wanting to be different than you are thing so uh so yeah i wanted to throw that in as an interesting kind of thing that you don't hear about as much now but again this all kind of links together because all these physical changes and we're once we get to chapter eight we're going to talk about how so much of being a teenager is about trying to figure out who you are and how you fit into things and 
part of that's complex because your your body's being complicated and and your biochemical changes are making your this complexity in your thoughts and your relationships and your feelings and and your feelings are more intense than before but also they seem vague and less articulate and all right i think i explained that slide but it's like there's sitting here as like a 40 year old talking about there's a real like kind of love i feel towards this idea of people trying to figure out their life it's like it's complicated it's complicated it was complicated for me it would be complicated for you it'll be complicated for my daughter and it's like there's no way to pull anyone else through it you have to go through it and what we can do though is i don't know, I think there's a real this is kind of it's weird to kind of promote the development psych in a development psych course but i think this is one of the reasons why topics like this matter because it helps us understand what's going on behind the waves or under the waves a bit and gives us more patience towards each other on all kinds of levels. Okay. So Piaget had this idea, right, that he called his uh, idea genetic epistemology, or if epistemology is our system of knowing how we make sense and how we know what we know or whatever, and it's like some people think that that's like a social construction that you're taught how to know and. Piaget is saying like, oh, no, it's his argument is that that's genetic and that kids go through these developmental jumps based on this, well, genetic underpinning. And so he talked about how, if it, just as a quick, quick recap, how first there's this sensory motor stage and then there's this pre-operational stage and this concrete operational. And then you get to this formal operational, this kind of parent-like or adult style level of thinking. And he actually thought that there was you might be interested to know he thought that there's actually another even higher stage or kind of alternate um, additional st developmental step that late teens and people in their early 20s sometimes go through what he called the messianic stage um so you should look up that if you find that interesting it's really fascinating so piaget thought that this formal operational stage is thinking becomes more abstract than than it was when they were kids in this concrete operational right where they're think of what concrete right means like very hard and solid and it's like the rules are this because they're this and as the kids getting older their thinking is getting more flexible and they're able to do more complex operations in their mind adolescents are no longer limited to actual concrete examples or experiences as anchors for thought they can they're better at conjuring up make-believe situations and abstract propositions and events that are purely hypothetical to try to reason logically about them. This abstract quality of thinking during the formal operational stage is evident in an adolescent's verbal problem-solving ability. So they're starting to get better at, if I'm telling you like, how's the okay, case so this happened and then this and this, and how's that relate to this and this is influence on this. It's like being able to hold that complexity. They're getting better at that. It's getting stronger and some of the reasons about this so if you were to say okay mike well how is formal operational stage that the adolescent mind is in different than what came right before it i'm going to use this this argument of basically hypothetical deduction reasoning adolescent egocentrism imaginary audience and personal fables so basically how i'm going to round up this presentation Okay, so these next kind of four slides are going to be my presentation of answering your question of like, how is this stage different than what came before? Okay, so Piaget thought that one of the big ways that there's a change is in what can be called hypothetical deductive reasoning. So basically the scientific method. You have an idea, you try to falsify it. It's like you to begin to think more like a a scientist you have this well the basic scientific method is you have a hypothesis and then you try to test that hypothesis with evidence and if you can't if you find evidence then that supports your conclusion then you have a finding if not then you go back to the drawing board and rethink your hypothesis and you know it's the this idea of deductive meaning that if you keep chipping away what's not the right answer and and this is kind of core to that's what deductive means right and the opposite is inductive which means to read into things deductive means to like understand something by getting more and more specific this hypothetical deduction it's basically doing science devising plans to solve problems and systematically testing solutions 
right? So science, you know, if you go back to the actual, what real science is, is like if you look at the work of someone like Karl Popper, who wrote about um, science and what this idea of frameworks are, and he said that like science is falsification, right? So if I have as a researcher this idea that this does this, I should try in every way possible to show that's wrong, and if in every way possible I can't show that that's wrong, if I can't falsify it, then it holds for now as theory. And that's the basis of the scientific model is that like no one gets final say, nothing's forever. It that's the going idea until it's unproven. But again, no one gets final say. No one gets special privilege in the sense of like because I said so and you can't say like because I said so and no one else can talk about it. You're not allowed to say those two things. That's Popper's idea, right? If you say those two things then it's not science. Because science has to be this. Well, it's the scientific method. That's what the scientific method means. So that this idea is that as the adolescent is getting this stronger mind or this uh, formal operational mind, being able to do this more complex things, like one of the things we're talking about is this ability to be more scientific and more like systematic or even, you know, in a more negative way, even more scheming, right? That like more complex in their scheming, the, the complexity of planning. Like that could be in a negative way too, right? To do this, then this, then this, then this, and how this person's going to be influenced by this. And it's not inherently all just like they're all just doing it for research, obviously, but it's that type of thinking more than what they're focused on. So there's another idea here, and this is coming a lot from the work of a, of a researcher named David Elkind, 1976. This concept of adolescent cognition having this kind of the term is, I have it written there, like the concept is adolescent cognition, but we're just still on this topic. The term is adolescent egocentrism, right? So we talked about how this has been a problem, for example, for the child on the three mountain test and their ability to take perspective. What's happening here is this, it's a different way of using this word that the adolescent kind of is under this impression that like everyone's judging them and everyone's much more aware of them. And do they think this shirt's cool? And do you think that I did something embarrassing and now everyone thinks, everyone thinks, everyone thinks it's like that kind of idea when in reality, how much time are you spending thinking about all these different people? It's like most of us are very focused on getting through our day and doing the tasks we need to do. And it's like, one of the things about the research is, is kind of suggests one of the things that's kind of characteristic of adolescence is this increased weight that you put on how much you think everybody is aware of what you're doing now the question i can hear somebody thinking is like how social media plays into all this and that almost deserves a whole course to try to answer that question how does social media affect adolescent egocentrism again there's another paper topic it's like it because it most certainly does because on the next slide i'm going to present this idea of imaginary audience and think of how that was an idea that was established right by this some of this early work by by elk and elk and, and think about in 1971 right like there would have been no conception of like whatever snapchat or instagram or whatever and how that would affect this this not fragile but vulnerable and emerging and this this self you know in, in in a lot of ways the most advanced thing in the universe that also struggles and is almost defined in ways by the struggle but not just by that and Yeah, so adolescent egocentrism, this heightened sense of self, but not in a arrogant way, in a lot of ways, more in a negative way of like worrying and, and angst around other people negatively looking at you or thinking about you or whatever, judging you. Now, this links with the idea of an imaginary audience, right? So. This is the idea that the adolescent believes that others are as interested in them as they are in themselves. And that sounds like it's like saying that they're arrogant, right? That they're like, they think they're so great and they think everyone else would think they're so great. But it's like, that's not what that means. It just means that they're so focused on themselves and how they're being judged by everyone that it's 
it's harder to realize, almost like it's hard for a child to have theory of mind, it's harder to realize that everyone else is also doing that and much less focused on you than it feels. Adolescents sense like they're on stage in early adolescence believing, and not believing, again, we're talking about these kind of under the waves, unconscious things, believing almost like they're the main actors and others or the audience, this imaginary audience or like your, your own movie can be very discerning for parents who are shifting from being a hero to the child to being an embarrassment. Suddenly, suddenly their adolescent wants to walk separately in the mall and is critical of everything the parent wears and how they act or talk or... And that it's like they don't want to be seen but by who by this like imaginary audience so really connected with this idea and remember because and, and these do connect because these are all the way that adolescent thinking is qualitatively different than the stage before and this is the idea of the personal fable or that the adolescent has this kind of unique or this increased sense of being unique and invincible and I think that there's actually a really interesting developmental psychology or evolutionary psychology I meant argument for why that's the case that it makes sense that when when the youth of the not the youth the emerging adults are at sort of this kind of 1820 that maybe having that group of your population more adventurous maybe there's evolutionary survival related because a lot of things about long-term survival evolutionarily would have been about keeping the gene pool healthy and expanding beyond the tribe and there's an interesting developmental aspect to this this personal fable is the part of that adolescent egocentrism that involves this sense of being unique and invincible this like idea that no one understands me particularly my parents they have no idea what i'm feeling even though like our feelings are the same and I might not know how you were betrayed or hurt or made happy or made sad, but I've had similar f emotions, right? The, the narrative story accompanying those are different. But as, as teens, we have this en enhanced sense of you would never understand me. Adolescent sense of personal uniqueness can make them believe no one can understand how they really feel. As part of their effort to retain a sense of personal uniqueness, they might craft a story of themselves that has fantasy aspects as, in, in, in addition to just reality. And these personal fables may frequently show up in adolescents' diaries, which is an idea from the textbook. I haven't spent a lot of time reading adolescents' diaries, but it's interesting, right? If you look at, this is basically saying, like, if you look at the writing, a lot of the times it's got this like this person like this and this 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 there's almost like a augmented or added layer right which is actually like the idea here is that this is like the brain's trying like to fill story in okay so I'm going to just put these ideas up if you can have these. I'm going to read to you a little bit here. This is my last kind of reading point. And I want to refer to some research by Deanna Kuhn, uh, K-U-H-N, 2009. Discuss some important characteristics of how adolescents process information and think. She argues that uh, large individual differences in cognitive levels are achieved during later childhood and adolescence. So her point is that like young kids develop that relatively, it seems, like young kids develop at more similar cognitive levels than they're going to be when they're older. And a lot of that differencing happens during this adolescence year, which is really interesting. You have how much of that is nature and nurture. Um, this variability supports the argument that adolescents are producers of their own development to a greater extent than children. That is, adolescents are more likely than children to initiate changes in thinking rather than depending on others such as parents or teachers to direct their thinking. Kuhn in 2009 argues that the most important cognitive changes in adolescence is improvement of their executive function, right, which is just this kind of catch-all term for like things like attention and decision making and uh, executive function, literally executive is like the decision making function, the role of the decision maker. This umbrella concept that consists of another a number of high-level cognitive processes linked to the development of the prefrontal cortex again this executive function involves managing our own thoughts to engage in goal-oriented behavior and self-control so compared to the child the teens getting better at staying focused on things and working towards a goal on average 
This cognitive control involves effective control in a number of areas, including controlling attention, reducing interfering thoughts, being cognitively flexible. Cognitive control continues to increase in adolescence and into emerging adulthood. Controlling attention is this key aspect of learning and thinking in adolescence and in adulthood. Distractions that interfere with attention come from external environments that are also from intrusive distractions, so things like worrying, uh, from within competing thoughts within the individual's mind, self-oriented thoughts such as worrying or self-doubt or intense emotionally laden thoughts may interfere with focusing attention at school, obviously. So in terms of high school, there's this other aspect, right? That like as the kids, there's in psychology, they call it top dog phenomena that well, it's basically, and we all experience, I can remember, I, I was in grade seven when my family moved from Kitchener to St. Clemens, which is a small town of like a thousand people. And so I went to the end of grade seven, which moving at the end of a school year is brutal. But I did like the end of the school year. The only reason I kind of fit in there was because luckily I played hockey and a lot of people there did. And then the next year, I did grade eight in St. Clemens and then went to Elmira High School. And I remember like, you know, being grade eight, you're like, the top of the school and then you go to grade nine and you're the youngest in the school and some of you might have just finished like kind of probably not super recently maybe a year or two ago high school and then now you're in university and you're like the new kid and then soon you're going to be like maybe going to grad school and you'll be like the new kid there again and then you'll be like you know the new person at your job and then it's like it's kind of interesting it's this moving from the kind of biggest or most powerful position in that developmental hierarchy to the smallest in the next one that high schools are larger and more bureaucratic and less personal or more impersonal than middle or junior high school. And teachers might, well, I say that, I say kind of pretty harshly, teachers often fail to make content relevant. I'll just say it like that. I don't need to sugarcoat it. Adolescents become immersed in complex peer group uh, cultures that demand conformity. Again, I'm not even touching on the media aspect. Students drop out for many reasons. Um, Male students are falling out of schools at, at record pace, especially higher ed. And a lot of it is this feeling uninvolved, basically. that the, um, There's actually a lot of interesting research on that. For women, it's often related to family things. And this is just kind of looking at statistical data of reasons people cite for dropping out. So it's these different kinds of pressure. Sometimes the pressure is, is family demands and... and dropping out of school if a man's dropping out of school to make money to support a family that's also family demands so some of these are, are obviously highly interrelated pressures okay we made it through lightning round now let's do the, the quiz prep review i'm going to just fire through these many stere many stereotypes of adolescence are too negative most adolescents today successfully negotiate from childhood to adolescence or to adulthood i mean however too many of today's adolescents are not provided with adequate opportunities to become and support to become competent adults right like they need that developmental preparation and support it's important to view adolescence as a heterogeneous group right so that's the opposite of homogeneous so heterogeneous means that people are very different because of these different portraits of adolescence emerge depending on the particular set of adolescents that we're talking about we're looking at how puberty uh, is influenced by things like nutrition and health and heredity and hormonal changes occurring in puberty are, are substantial, very significant. Puberty effects sometimes happen, and again, this is approximate and depending on what we're talking about, but things like height, for example, seems to peak earlier in girls, sometimes as much as two years. Individual variation, though, is substantial, so those two-year differences only make sense as a statistical average. Okay, adolescents show considerable interest in body image, obviously, because they're also becoming much more influenced. Because it's not just that they're interested in how they look, it's that they're they're concerned about it because they're noticing other people noticing, and it's now all of a sudden like a social thing, right? This whole idea of body image that we're going to talk about a lot more in chapter eight. Girls tending to report negative, more negative body images than boys in general, but also especially in early adolescence early maturing girls we talked about are being more vulnerable to a number of risks. Number three, changes in the brain during adolescence involve the thickening of the corpus callosum and a gap in maturation between the limbic system, right? So there's this um, 
gap between the limbic system reaching its kind of final state and the prefrontal cortex not yet. So there's this gap between sort of the higher end thinking things through isn't to its end point yet, but your emotional system is, which is quite characteristic of understanding a lot of the behavioral st stuff around teenage experience. Adolescence is a time of sexual exploration, sexual experimentation. Um, the research in development psychology is very clear that earliest uh, sexual activity is associated with all kinds of negative developmental outcomes. Um, again, it's hard to make comments like that without sounding judgy. It's this is just reporting on the literature. Adolescence is a, at the critical juncture of health. Poor nutrition and a lack of exercise are main concerns. Many adolescents stay up late uh, and are getting later than when they were children, and they're getting a lot less sleep than they need developmentally, right? Like the adolescent brain needs a lot of sleep. There's a lot of processing. Okay, just a bit more. Um, we didn't talk about much about drug use. I, I did mention substance use. It's obviously a concern. Obviously, depending on which drug you're talking about, there are different types of concerns, obviously. Well, not obviously. There's a lot of complexities around how, what psychology has to say about that. Right? And it's a lot of the experimentation and a lot of the risk taking is also associated with this desire to fit in. So this is why it's such a complicated topic. We also talked about the complexity of things like eating disorders. I talked about Piaget's formal operational stage and that thinking and the thoughts starts to become more abstract and more idealistic and more logical, or I was making this argument of more researcher-like than it was before. Although not, not, although not everyone, sorry, reaches that last stage. Okay, and then just a couple more here. We're almost at the end that adolescent egocentrism, which involves this heightened sense of self-consciousness or being hyper focused on what other people are thinking of me and how I fit in reflects another one of these cognitive changes that is involved in Piaget's description of these developmental, um, I call it genetic epistemology or these qualitative changes in how we make sense of our world. Changes in information processing in adolescence are mainly reflected of this a reflection of this kind of improved executive functioning. Sorry if you're writing word for word, because I know I'm like kind of reading word for word sometimes and then sort of summarizing sometimes, so that might be confusing. But this idea that the improvement of executive and uh, function, including things like cognitive control and attention and making decisions and all this is improving. And then the idea that the transition to middle or junior high school is often stressful. And one of the sources, this move from being kind of the top dog, they say, or like the coolest, like the grade eights to the grade nines, the lowest position. Thank you for being such an awesome class. Um, I kind of intentionally tried to leave a little bit of wiggle room at the end. So hopefully this is going to be the last chapter presentation you have a quiz on. I think I'm still lined up to do a presentation on dreams, but I want you to kind of have a little bit of uh, breathing room here at the end. So. I'll kind of send out a message soon with a little bit of an update of, of kind of final things to finish. But yeah, I just say again, I love those Giants of Psychology assignments. That was awesome. And I'm really hyped to start to get into some of the uh, second ones, I think, of philosophies of mine. So, so yeah, thanks for being such a great class. This has been honestly uh, a blast. And I hope you've learned something this term and enjoyed these and, you know, have, haven't got too annoyed with me and thought that these were okay. Anyways, you're awesome people. And uh, thanks for being such a cool class. I just honestly appreciate it. I'm not sure how to articulate it, but it's uh, it's been fun, you know, especially, I don't know, since I just kind of just dove into it and I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to, if I, I think if I'm comfortable and if I'm having fun, then hopefully it makes the videos like less boring and a little bit more engaging. And anyways, thanks for being a cool class. And uh, I hope, I wish you all well and I'll see you soon.